Welcome to the very first uh, Future of Games speaker um, presentation for this year. Um, really excited today to have our speaker, and I'm going to introduce him in just a second. Um, before I introduce him, I'm going to use the bully pulpit to uh, give a little advertisement for the Future of Games speaker series. So uh, it's a speaker series that we have that focuses on the future of games. Uh, and if you're interested in receiving notifications about upcoming speakers, you can go to the uh, Digital Games Research Center website, dgrc.ncsu.edu, and uh, join the announcements mailing list and get uh, updates about upcoming events here uh, and all around campus. Um, so with that said, um, I'm really excited to introduce our speaker. Um, Arnav Jala is an assistant professor in the Jack Baskin School of Engineering at uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, he has uh, previously held research positions at the IT University Copenhagen, at uh, the uh, Institute for Creative Technologies at USC, and at Virtual Heroes here in, um, in North Carolina. Um, he holds a PhD uh, from this very department, and a master's degree from here as well, and a bachelor's in engineering from, uh, bachelor's, sorry, in computer engineering from Gujarat University in India. So Arnav today is going to be talking about his research on uh, the talk is titled Toward Real-Time Adaptive Camera Control in Games. Thank you, Michael, for this very nice introduction. It's, it's great to be back here because I've heard so many seminars with all those forms that you people have. Uh, uh, until very recently, I was here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about some of the work uh, uh, in camera control, which is sort of my general research area, is uh, cinematic communication in games. And uh, uh, after graduating from NC State, well, somewhere in the ETD, you will be able to find my thesis, which was on uh, non-interactive camera control. So after leaving NC State, I started delving in, uh, into interactive camera control in games. Uh, so uh, I'll briefly introduce what I mean by camera control in games. So in 3D environments, uh, all the information that you get is through your camera, right? Uh, in games, user has a lot of control over the camera. Uh, in, in movies, director has uh, control over the camera and how the shots are composed and uh, camera movements occur. Uh, this is important because uh, as environments become more and more complex as we move more towards procedural content generation. Uh, it's very hard to then maintain camera views of users uh, to, the, to the salient points uh, that, that are part of the story or, or, or narratives that people experience when they are in these virtual environments. Uh, uh, this is a complicated problem because uh, it has to deal with uh, many different camera parameters like position, orientation, field of view. Uh, and it's critical in computer games because even if it's a little bit off, you notice it. Uh, and I don't know how many of you play 3D games, but camera control is one of, one of the most discussed uh, uh, topics when you look at game uh, criticisms. Right? Uh, so some of the important properties uh, for cameras to have uh, in games is that it should be real time. Uh, and now that environments are getting more complex, that's harder. Uh, harder to do. It should be environment independent. So we want, we, we want to work with general camera control algorithms that apply to many different uh, types of engines. Uh, and it should be dynamic, uh, and it should support interactivity. Uh, there has been a lot of research uh, previously in camera control, uh, and uh, also a lot in this department. So William Bears uh, got, his P, uh, got his PhD, and uh, uh, developed constraint satisfaction approaches to camera control in virtual environments. Uh, although a lot of work in the research community has focused on this, very little has actually transferred over to, to the industry. The industry still uses very simple constraint-based techniques. Most of the times, uh, if you notice, cameras are either just follow the player uh, with a little bit of spring physics uh, or top down, and, and then those are fixed. So there's not much experimentation, although camera actually camera control algorithms, even the old ones that were developed in the research community, are, are, are quite, quite a bit more expressive. Uh, one of the problems uh, with these solutions is that uh, they are very quantitative constraint-based uh, approaches where 
constraints have to be specified, numeric constraints, geometric constraints on the camera variables. And this is not accessible to game designers, uh, which is why game designers choose to design game mechanics around fixed camera profiles. Uh, and uh, so today in, in my talk, I'm going to talk about two separate projects. Uh, hopefully, there will be some connection that you'll see between the two. Uh, uh, I'll first talk about uh, a more accessible uh, camera control representation that is accessible to designers. So it takes some of the camera control specification out of the programmer's hands and into the designer's hands. Uh, that's what our goal is. So we, we, we have a new representation for uh, geometric constraints for camera control. Uh, and I'll show that this approach runs in real time. Uh, and then in the second part, uh, I, we've started addressing the user interaction part of camera control. So we want to learn uh, what user preferences are in terms of camera profiles as they play. And we want to identify some sort of a relationship between uh, user perception and the information that is communicated through the camera uh, within a game. Uh, so uh, in, my, in, in the first part of my talk, I'll talk about CamOn, which is a system that uh, uh, that we built. One of my PhD students is working on it uh, at IT University of Copenhagen. Uh, it's an autonomous camera system that takes in viewing goals and uh, it does smooth camera animation and frame composition. Uh, a lot of the past approaches did frame composition really well, but there was no connection with camera motion. So in games, whenever you see cutscenes, uh, all of the animations have to be uh, specified as spline curves and handcrafted by designers, uh, cinematic designers in a 3D, uh, you know, 3D editor. Uh, in, and so we want to actually address both the problem of frame composition as well as uh, camera animation. So in our approach, we use uh, the artificial potential field formalism. So we represent cameras. Uh, a, a camera as having two particles that are floating in space. One is for the pos position of the camera, and the other one is the view target of the camera. And we put these two particles inside uh, a, a 3D space with potential values, and then we, we use potential field equations to have uh, these two particles converge on uh, the right solution using the phys physical uh, equations uh, of, of potential. Uh, the benefit of this approach is that uh, it's low computational cost because all of this can be done in hardware. Uh, any change in viewing uh, or camera motion uh, constraints can be done by just changing potentials uh, by a system. Uh, and it's, as you will see in the demo, it, it's easy to visualize for designers. So designers don't have to worry about actually placing camera paths specifically but just to constrain them by specifying potential values uh, on the 3D objects that are being put in the, uh, in the scene. And so the camera algorithm iteratively converges to an optimal configuration given uh, an input position, uh, camera constraints, and a scene description that contains potential field values. Uh, and the output is, is some configuration for the camera in terms of its position, uh, in terms of the position that the particle converges to, and then the view point that the view particle converges to. So I'll actually, I'll try to show a demo of running system. So this is just a simple scene. Uh, what we have here is, of course, my resolution is too small, so you don't see the entire scene. But so here what I'm doing is I, I'll, I'm from here, I'm giving it different view targets. And uh, so this is like a, a really close shot of this heron, right? Uh, and the camera converges to that uh, pretty quickly in real time. And then as the heron moves, it's, it's in real time trying to maintain uh, the position. There's, I can visualize the potential field. So there is a view particle, and the red colored dot is the viewing position that is calculated. So that is actually a close shot of a heron would have a really low potential uh, right in the middle of where the heron's face is, right? So 
uh, for a cinematic close shot, you want to have the camera up uh, facing the face. But if you want a, a, a long shot of the heron, you want the camera to be sort of centered at the middle. And so depending on the shot you want, what the designer can do now is uh, if they have another 3D model of, let's say, a person, then all they need to do is specify the low potential fields for the medium shot uh, and, and put a little low potential value somewhere on the texture, let's say. Uh, and it's easier for them instead of actually calculating values or putting in specific numbers for constraints. Uh, I'll jump to a two shot now. So this is also flexible because I'll turn off the potential field. So now there are some birds here that are running around and uh, I want a two shot of these two red colored birds. And as you can see, as soon as I gave it a new view target, the system automatically uh, changed the potential values so that the potential values for the new view targets were reduced. And then uh, the potential value for the heron was then again restated to the, to the old one. And now what's happening is uh, the camera is now, as they are flying, it's adapting in real time. And the view when uh, position particles are automatically following the view target. Question? So the idea is, I uh, the view target that I gave was a two shot of the two birds there. So the idea is that the camera should have both of those in the frame at all times, the two red ones, right? So it's trying to keep them both in, in view. So what's happening is, and this is something I have in my slides, so it's a good transition back. So what happens is that both of those birds that are view targets will have low potential. And then the resulting point view target will be the sum of the potentials of low potentials for both, which, which will basically create a big low potential area whenever they are close, close together, right? And so the view particle will, will sort of be in between the two. So there's, there's a system that actually computes uh, the average of the potentials of all the view targets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so when you are playing the game, then what happens is you have multiple objects, and then you will have, uh, depending on what, what kind of game it is, if it's a, a first-person shooter, then you will have your camera have view constraints on which objects around you are uh, have uh, low potential. So as soon as a new view target, based on your game event state, uh, the game manager uh, determines that you have a new view target, it will automatically then adjust the potential for the new view target to be lower than the rest of the scene, right? And so it will, so for example, here I, we have another example where there are several robots that are actually running at you. And the idea is, that you have a camera that's sort of behind view of, of your player with all three robots uh, in front of you. If one of them rushes in, the camera slightly adjusts because the potentials then shift, right? So, so that actually affects the camera position subtly so that you know that that person is approaching and has suddenly made a move uh, instead of keeping it fixed. Question.
So the idea is that the camera is there, there, there might be extreme conditions where let's say somebody who's rushing is right wired to behind you, right? In that case, you will not find a solution. So I have, uh, I'll show a couple of examples where, where there are problems, where you have either an over-constrained shot or an under-constrained shot. Uh, so when, when you are over-constrained, where you have to keep two things visible, uh, the camera then usually just switches to some, some point where both of those are possible. Problem with that first person example is that uh, in a first person game, you're always sort of first person. And in that case, it's very hard to keep, take the camera completely out of your hands uh, when you're controlling it, right? So, uh, but if you are say playing third person where your camera is sort of behind you, then the camera will basically adjust the distance or height or orientation, right? And so, so the user experience part is the second part of my talk. Uh, and so we did some experiments on exactly how, what would happen if you were to give, have a completely uh, auto-controlled camera uh, that can actually explore all kinds of different camera profiles without the user actually controlling it, but still give a good user experience. Uh, and th there aren't any games that that use more than one camera profile. It's basically game genres are defined by camera profiles, right? And one of the problems is because designers don't want to experiment with game mechanics. So their game mechanics are designed very specifically for first person camera or top down camera, right? Uh, if you do have, you do have sometimes options of switching. So let's say you're playing a racing game, you have uh, the option of switching from like cockpit view to, uh, to behind view. But, but then the user can con just selects one and then it's fixed, right? It doesn't uh, change. Yeah, so the, what, what, what we are going towards is it's still under your control, right? So you, you can zoom in really close, uh, but then what if you miss something important that's happening outside of your viewport, but the game actually wants to communicate that to you, to give you a better experience of the narrative, right? For example. Uh, so for that, the idea is whenever, as, as your goals within the game change, uh, the camera automatically should adapt to it. And you shouldn't even worry about it. Actually, it should be invisible. Uh, it should be like movies. So in movies, uh, we see lots of complicated cuts and, and, and transitions and movements, right? Uh, fast cutting and all that. But we don't actually notice it, right? Because we're interested in the content itself. The camera becomes invisible. Uh, if it's not done well, we notice it, right? Because it's not done well. So, so the game camera should be like that. It should sort of be invisible, any transitions that the camera is making. As you are playing, you basically don't, if, if I ask you what happened in the last five minutes in terms of the camera, you, would, you wouldn't remember it. But it would have gone all the way from first person to top down, back to first person. But you wouldn't have noticed it because you, what you were doing at that time, your mechanic, was what was supported by that camera. And you just switched mechanics. You didn't actually switch points of views. So that's where we want to go. At least that's what I'd be interested in uh, going forward. So currently, the constraints that we support are uh, subject visibility constraints, because we have two particles, uh, uh, and obstacle avoidance for uh, so visibility constraints are, con are the ones that control the view particle within the constraint field. And then the obstacle avoidance is done by the actual position particle. So a little bit about artificial potential fields. So this is an iterative technique that is commonly used by robotics researchers for path planning uh, or getting robots move across obstacles. Uh, and uh, it has actually been used for camera control. It was first used, proposed by Beckhaus back in 2000. 
but that was for uh, a virtual camera tour of a museum. And what Beckhouse did was basically uh, strung a series of uh, potential value scripts along the museum so that the camera would then just follow one after the other. As the script triggered uh, potentials, the camera would automatically sort of converge to the next uh, item in, inside the museum. Uh, and then the viewpoint in, in this case was fixed and it was not dynamic. So what we did was we, we, we came up with multiple potential fields in which different camera particles could, uh, could live in. So for example, there's a position APF and there's a view APF that are both uh, maintained in parallel and they're both sort of independent of each other. Uh, it's really fast because now you don't have to actually worry about the position plus the orientation of the camera, which in previous approaches, uh, previous constraint-based approaches, you had to specify complicated uh, constraint uh, values that were sort of interrelated in terms of uh, position and framing altogether. And so uh, this makes it easier for the designers because they just have to worry about now one particle at a time. Uh, there are some issues with it, uh, which I'll talk about, but, it, but it's a good starting point. Uh, question? Yes, so it, it, has, it has this problem of sort of local optima uh, where, it, where you, there's a, a, a little region where you see lots of switching back and forth. And for it, right now, we, we basically clamp it. So you sort of use some sort of a filter. It's like a low-pass filter where you can say, well, anything within this tolerable range, uh, and it, it shouldn't move. Uh, and we also have this division of spaces. So if you want, let's say, a close shot uh, of the heron, then it, it doesn't actually jump from, say, left to the right. If there's no solution available, it just slides. So, so there, there's this uh, idea of semantic volumes that was proposed, which was an extension to William Barris's work on constraints, uh, 2007 smart graphics. Uh, where they introduce the idea of semantic volumes. So there are these semantic volumes uh, that specify a sort of cinematic front, right uh, profile, different views. And so we, we basically say uh, only within the semantic volume uh, try to get a, a close shot. And so it doesn't jump to another semantic volume. Uh, so there's a check for that. But there is the slight jerky movement sometimes when it's, it's, it's trying to converge to a solution and there are just too many solutions within that region. So um, you know the problem where uh, Lazarus Lane is, there's a tracking shot of this character walking down a, uh, a sidewalk in front of a building and the shot is from the side next to the building wall and then when he passes in front of a window, the camera then leaps back into the room to see him because it's a little bit better to have a farther camera away. And then as he passes the window, the camera jumps back to the outside of the building. Does, does the process that you were talking about, the clamping down or the semantic volumes address that? Or is that sort of still a, a potential issue? So that's, uh, it, it would address, uh, let me think about it. Right. So in this case, what will happen is, uh, in this Lazarus Lane example, which I'll, I'll sort of give a back, background on this. Uh, so there was, uh, there was a sequence that in my sort of thesis work that I did, there was a sequence where the camera was supposed to have uh, a long, long shot of a character moving 
along in a, in a three D environment. Right? Uh, when it when the character moved in a narrow corridor, the camera came up with a shot that was basically in front of the wall, which means that you lo you lost the full view of the long shot, uh, but you still didn't have occlusions, right? Uh, but there was this one place where as the character was moving, there was a window that popped up in that wall. And what the camera did was the camera basically went right back and then went in again. So during, while the character was passing through the window, the camera again went back to the long shot. Uh, and in this case, what would happen is you basically have a potential field. Uh, in the potential field for the camera position particle, you would have a, a potential field uh, that would be an obstacle for the walls. Uh, but then if, if the window wasn't actually specified as an obstacle, then the camera would then sort of go back and then, uh, but it wouldn't be jerky because you could actually specify different function, function profiles uh, for the potential field. So you could actually have, let's say, a tower with, say, I don't know, a 3D Gaussian kind of profile. So the camera, when it moves around, it would move smoothly instead of sort of jerky motions, right? Because uh, the, the particle is actually trying to find, uh, is, is avoiding the obstacle around that function. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, uh, I have the, I've been holding off on asking because I have the feeling we're keeping you from getting to the, the definitions, but there's a whole class of motion constraints that you haven't mentioned. I mean, it's a, yeah. when you say smooth motion, how many derivatives are smooth? So, yeah, we haven't, this is just, initial work, so we haven't actually considered smooth motion yet. And is there a notion of how much inertia the camera has? No. Or it, bounds it on the forces? Any, no. It's, it's a very simple model right now. Uh, that's actually in my future work. So okay. You, well, and the other question is, you know, if you have, if you do put constraints on that, would, does it make sense to have constraints related to human inner ear? vertigo problems. Uh, yeah, so, so those kind of motion constraints, as we specify more motion constraints, we also have to have sort of the cinematic uh, ex experience of the user. So we have to take into account which kinds of motion constraints or at what level do they actually make sense uh, in terms of user experience, so like vertigo. Or, or even actually blocking out certain uh, specific camera motion paths if they don't make cinematic sense. So uh, narrow down the possible space of animations by specifically blocking out certain parts. Um, but again, the idea is to then give that to designers. So once you have the algorithms there, then you let the designer figure out how to space, place potential fields and how to make them interact and not worry about them actually sort of hand drawing every single uh, cinematic. So, so we basically took, what we did was we recasted the frame constraint from existing approaches uh, into this potential feed-like approach and figured out what kind of uh, potential values represent certain constraints. And right now we only have sort of visibility, size, and view angle constraints. Uh, and as I said, uh, each each new viewing target or each new position then adds a potential uh, to the potential field. So the idea then is to have an algorithm that's just constantly uh, tweaking your potential fields, which is a quick operation for, for the graphics card. Right? Uh, and then particle positions are constantly being computed uh, uh, within the potential field. So as the potential field changes, the particles are automatically then trying to get to the lowest potential uh, position. So that's automatic. Uh, and we've actually run, so we have two implementations of these uh, on, on actual game engines. The demo I showed you was on the Unity engine. And it actually runs on the browser, uh, and it's really fast. Um, and we compared it to sort of the traditional, more complicated constraint uh, 
constraint solving systems. And although our approach is still new and uh, we only have a subset of constraints that we, uh, that we represent, it's still good enough to, uh, as you saw in the demo, to, to cover most of the basic stuff that games need. So for, from a game, games point of view, it still covers uh, a fair amount of uh, ground. Uh, we also saw some interesting cases. So this is just the potential visualization uh, that we saw in the demo. Uh, but there are some under constrained and over constrained situations that you get into in this demo where sometimes you have, uh, in this case, when you have the two shot of the two birds, uh, the constraint is that you are looking at them from, from behind. But sometimes the birds uh, are, are very close together uh, and they, they suddenly come close together. Uh, so in that case, you have a sudden jump because uh, now your camera shot was really wide and now they suddenly came in close together. So that's sort of an under constrained shot. Uh, and, and the camera then what it does is it actually interpolates. So it doesn't jump to the close shot. It sort of slowly moves towards it instead of jumping in. At what rate does it move towards them? I mean, there must uh, be some parameter like, controlling like, that. Yeah, yeah, so it's 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 a tweak of parameter there. Uh, So as you can see, as they move, you can see the entire thing here. But over your shoulder. So it depends on how, uh, what's your step size of movement that's, uh, that's being calculated. So we actually had to play around with it because the first time we did it, it was just moving really fast. Uh, and so we had to actually slow it down a little. I think they're going all over the place. Right, so this is the shot where it, uh, the constraint is to be over the shoulder of this black bird at the same time keeping the blue bird in view. So as, as, as the blue bird sort of changes positions, uh, the camera then constantly sort of adapts, but it keeps, keeps, always keeps within the over the shoulder semantic volume. So if you think of the semantic volume for over the shoulder as being a cone that goes from over the so shoulder out, then it's trying to be within that space. This doesn't look like it's doing a good job. Is that because we're only seeing a part of the? Only, yeah. So it's, oh, okay. Yeah. So here, it's actually over here. So whenever it's it's moving off screen. It might. Yeah, that's a good idea. There you go. Great idea. Yeah, it's it's trying to be constantly over here, and then it's, but then as they move up and down and in different direction, it it, it it's trying to maintain it, and it. it it's doing a decent job. We have to we have to experiment a bit more with sort of why, or you know, why a certain tweak would work in this situation, and maybe it may not work in another situation. But uh, how would it handle? Oh, sorry. How would it handle a conflict if, say, your constraint was to follow behind the shoulder of the blackbird while keeping the bluebird in view? If they were to fly in opposite directions such that it wasn't possible to follow both right. of those constraints, how does it settle a conflict like that? Right, so that's, that's actually my next slide. Uh, so, so that's an over-constrained shot uh, where you want to constrain it to a solution that isn't there. And, and what, what it does right now, it, it just goes, tries to go as far away as possible uh, as long as they're both in view and then it relaxes the view constraint. But then uh, it, it constantly evaluates alternatives 
to see if, if at least one of the one of the birds can be uh, for if one of for one of the birds you have like this behind the bird uh, satisfied or not but it doesn't act this doesn't jump it evaluates the two solutions uh, and then just picks whichever one is better so it chooses one of the two rather than attempting to sort of average the two and I guess yeah it doesn't average the two yeah so it, it goes back as far as possible and then it slides towards the one where you know you are constantly behind one of the birds but it doesn't yeah because you would have that would be a weird solution right because uh, and these are constantly moving as well so uh, if we actually made the camera move to one of those positions then as soon as you did that, that would be one jump, and then you would have to jump back again if they again went in line, right? So the idea is to minimize jumps, is to keep within the local neighborhood as much as possible, uh, and then just move sort of back and forth uh, in this particular case. So the motion is always tied to the focus object, that not to anything else in the world. Uh, I mean, the, the, the example that comes to mind is, suppose I'm trying to watch or film the Millennium Falcon as it goes into warp drive or whatever. I mean, are you, if you have bounds on the, the motion of the, the camera, then you're going to see it zoom off, you know, instantly and, and you try to catch up maybe. But uh, if you're tied to the, to the spaceship, then you zoom off with it and the sun disappears or something like that. Yeah, so you, here you have to specify a view target and then a constraint on, on the distance from the view target. So it maintains distance from view target. So depending on which view target you pick, it will match the motion to that. So it's but if you had both of them, then that, that would be this kind of a situation where it will try to minimize, it will pick sort of whichever one is uh, slower moving. So it's, the camera is then you're assuming is really the same physics as the target object. Any any yeah, acceleration it can attached, do, you yeah, can do it's as well. To the target object, okay. yeah, because it's trying to maintain the distance constraint uh, because it's, it has very specific like framing constraints. So it's constantly trying to maintain that. It'll only relax it if uh, if there is an occlusion. Yeah, it's constantly, uh, so what happens is that the particle is in, if it's a static scene, for example, that heron close shot when it was just standing, uh, the, the camera converts to a solution and then the particles are sort of at their lowest potentials, right? So everything is, in, is stable. As soon as you introduce something new, the potential field changes and then the camera automatically, the particles automatically then uh, try to converge to the lowest potential. Uh, and then, so, so that brings up another issue with this, is what if it's in, in a stable configuration and something somewhere completely different changes? So the idea is what we do is we basically just, uh, whenever any new potential, lower potential target is added, we increase the potential of everything else so that the camera actually converges to, uh, or at least moves, so it doesn't stay at the stable state. Right, so that, again, I'll talk about that in the second part. Uh, it's adding, adding, it's making it adaptive. Uh, so this is just uh, testing out the algorithms for camera movement and the representation. Uh, and then, so the idea was to actually just take uh, these complicated constraint specification algorithms uh, where you put in lists of constraints of all kinds and specific numbers like, uh, 
view angle from uh, 70 to 130 uh, uh, and then take it out and then represent it in such a way that uh, an algorithm that performs equally well and, and represents all the basic uh, constraints that the game industry cares about for now uh, and then put it in the hands more of the designers or, or at least in a representation that designers and programmers can both sort of relate to. Um, and, and so this was just uh, sort of proof of concept for, for this particular approach. Uh, and we, we are looking at, uh, so right now it's limited number of motion constraints and we are looking at sort of more complicated models uh, as well. Uh, there is no occlusion constraint because the potential fields are separate between the view part. So the view particle is, it, is in its own potential field and the uh, movement particle is in a different one. If there is an occlusion, then we can't detect that, right? Because uh, the, the camera will be at one position and then it will be looking at another one, but there's something in the middle uh, that both, that should be in both both potential fields somehow. So we're, we're addressing that now. Uh, one way to do it is to actually uh, add occlusions to both potential values or just do some sort of a trace between the particles to make sure that nothing in the world obstructs, obstructs uh, that trace, right? If you connect a straight line, uh, does it work? So, uh, and then it has this jerky motion due to local optima that was also mentioned. So that's the first part, yes. So sorry to keep harping on this. So if you just have one target like the Blackbird, um, are you going, is the camera going to be in rigid, a rigid frame with respect to that Blackbird? Yes. Once it It didn't look a, like that in the, or was there other Oh, uh, it was actually, I think it was moving, so. And this is the other thing is no matter where the camera is, as soon as I say this, it'll, Now this one is actually moving, but when it stands, the camera will just be fixed. But it's not rigid with respect, is, what, is it rigid with respect to the center of, geometric center of the, the heron or, or what? It's not related to geometric center of the heron. It's, it's related to, uh, so like I said. Uh, the well, there, see the distance to the heron changed as the heron moved. So right. you're not, if, if if you just have a single target and the thing that you were describing, it seems like you would always be exactly the same distance away. In the oh, same right. So what, what happens is as the heron moves sort of forward front and back and, and changes, as soon as the camera gets to some acceptable solution, it stops. So there's an entire region where, uh, an entire region of possible points which are all acceptable cinematically to so keep this. The, that's the so, lopping off of the. Yeah, exactly. So, so as soon as you are within the acceptable region, it, it'll stop. So with, you will get slight differences within that region whenever the heron stops. Okay, so that was the first part. And uh, I have 15 minutes for my entire second part, which is great. So I'm just going to run through it now. Uh, now, I actually think the second part is way more exciting. Uh, uh, so the second part is interesting. So like I said, what, what we're aiming at is uh, a camera system that is invisible, that you don't control by hand, right? So you don't look. It, it anticipates where you want to look and how you want to look, and it sort of adapts to it such that it does it invisibly. Uh, and I was trying to work with one of my colleagues, Georgios, uh, and he said, well, that doesn't make sense to me. And I was like, no, it's possible. It's like, no, it's not possible. I'm, and he was thinking of first-person games. Uh, I said, no, it, it can be done. Uh, and he had a pack, like Miss Pac-Man CD, because he does like evolutionary algorithms for Miss Pac-Man. Like, we can do it in Pac-Man. Uh, and so we did it in Pac-Man, actually. So we implemented a camera controller within a game that was, was basically 3D Pac-Man. and uh, uh, and so you, you controlled a Pac-Man uh, and you had zombies and you had to collect as many tokens as you could in 90 seconds. So what we did was uh, we, we, took, we took this camera controller uh, that 
uh, that could take in three parameters, distance from Pac-Man, height from Pac-Man. Uh, your view target was always center of Pac-Man as you were controlling it. Uh, and then it took an additional like frame coherence value uh, which determined how, how, much the, how fast the camera reacted to your input. So if you turn 90 degrees right, would it directly snap to 90 degrees right or would it slowly uh, converge to, nine, to, to your new view target? When you say distance to the Pac-Man, you mean key, uh, to its front, distance. frontal distance or can you rotate around it? No, you could, no. So uh, it was always fixed. So you, you were always behind Pac-Man. So if you turn 90 degrees right, it would go, well, 90 degrees right if there was no frame coherence and it would smoothly move if there was. So, so those were the three parameters we choose, we chose, right? Okay. So now let's say there's, uh, you have, you know, using these three parameters, you have uh, zero max distance, zero max height, and zero to one frame coherence. What is zero, zero, zero in this space? It's first person. Zero distance, zero height, you're always looking in front, uh, and then zero coherence, which means uh, if you turn 90 degrees, it snaps, right? Okay, what is max distance, max height, and max coherence? It's two and a half D view, like chess, like a chess board that you, that you see, something like this. Uh, and then zero distance, maximum height, and maximum coherence is your standard Pac-Man, right? So now you have this entire space where any three values of these would give you some sort of a view into the maze. Now this is interesting because in a first person view, zero, 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 you would only see one corridor at a time. And in the Pac-Man view, you see the entire maze at a time. Now that completely changes how you play the game. So those are actually different games now. Because uh, now your goals are different and the way you play the game uh, is different. So what we did was, given all the game mechanics the same, can we actually find sort of measurable differences in player experience uh, for these different camera viewpoints and how these are connected? Uh, and my colleague was interested in sort of affective player modeling. So uh, whether players actually perceived different emotions when they played different uh, games that were designed on maze ball. So we, we took eight variants, eight different variants in this space, equally the equidistant variants in this space. Uh, and we ran an experiment uh, with, with subjects and what we did was we, we connected them to uh, sensors like heart rate, uh, skin conductance, and blood volume pulse sensors uh, that were is actually cheaply available from uh, a game called Journey to the Wild Divine. And we, we had them play uh, pairs of games. So we, we gave them variant A and in variant so game A and game B, which had two different variants. And they would play this. And at the end, we would ask them their preference for one of the games based on different emotions. So was, would you prefer A or B for fun? Would you prefer A or B for challenge? So it was like a four uh, AFC, four alternative force choice uh, uh, system that, that we used. Uh, and this was whether A was more challenging, whether B was more challenging, where they were, were they equally challenging or couldn't say. So we had each subject play eight pairs of variants. Uh, and then we had a ninth one that we didn't use for, uh, for the study, which was the top-down maze ball, top-down Pac-Man like view. Uh, and we had 36 subjects, uh, aged 21 to 47 years. Uh, a lot of them were males. Uh, and then we, we collected data for all of these different emotions. Uh, and in, in this particular talk, if I do get time, I'll go into a little bit of detail uh, of the correlations we found uh, between challenge preferences in, the, in this experiment to the amount of information they had uh, in the game. So we actually recorded anything that we could in the game, including 
uh, all the signals, all the heart rate, uh, skin conductance signals, uh, and blood volume pulse, which was what the hardware gave us. Uh, and then we calculated different features based on that. We also recorded all the camera variables uh, as, the, as they were playing the games. Uh, that was like three, three times per second was, uh, was our polling rate. Uh, we also calculated uh, an information function which consisted of uh, the number of grid cells that were visible on an average uh, within 90 seconds of play for a particular variant. Uh, we also measured the number of tokens that they could see on an average uh, for each variant. And we also measured the number of enemies they could see uh, on each variant. So our idea was, uh, and this is why we particularly looked at challenge, uh, was how getting different amounts of information through camera variants uh, results in challenge preferences for players. So we want to have the camera controller automatically switch between profiles as the person is playing based on whether we want to increase or decrease challenge, for example. So our first analysis on this data was order of play, because that was one of our concerns. Uh, you play, if, when you played the first pair of games, then you sort of figured out what the game was about. Uh, and uh, we didn't change anything in the game. So they started at the same start position. The enemies and the tokens were at the exact same place. So we wanted to see if there was some sort of learning uh, that happened as they played subsequent pairs of variants. Uh, what we observed was that there wasn't. So uh, we actually determined that in our analysis that order of play effects uh, were not significant. Uh, and familiarity with the game does not affect preferences. And one of the reasons why we kept it to a 90 second intense game was because of that. Uh, if we gave them more time to play, they, they, we, there was a chance that they would familiarize more with the game. Within 90 seconds, they were just worried about sort of quick uh, trying to get more points. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is a chart that, that sort of shows uh, their preference. So the other concern was, uh, initially, was what if they all came back with all the variants were equally challenging. So that wouldn't be interesting, but it wasn't the case. And although they had an option of saying both variants were interesting or none of them, I, they couldn't tell the difference, uh, they didn't actually, they actually had very specific preferences uh, uh, between a and B variants that, that were shown to them. Question? How, how do you know, <clears throat> I'm a little, I'm just a little unclear. How do you know that um, so different, different camera choices will affect, game, affect the, your ability to play the game differently depending on the games? So you may, it may actually, you know, it'll interfere with your ability to play games where you need the global view versus where you need, you know, very specific targeting view or something like that. So is this, are these results specific to, how specific to the Pac, the 3D Pac-Man game is this? They are very specific to 3D Pac-Man, so that's a good question. Yes, uh, they are specific to Pac-Man, uh, although uh, they do show that if you, they, they establish a methodology and some algorithms where you can uh, collect data and then run uh, run these learning algorithms for modeling uh, players' preferences and then correlate them with uh, the information that you have in the game, depending on what it is, uh, and then have some sort of system that chooses between a different space of camera parameters, not just distance, height, and coherence, but some other uh, camera parameters. For example, field of view, if you are doing first person, and if that's the only camera parameter you want to adapt, uh, then you could just have an experiment that modulates field of view automatically based on challenge, for example. Was there one here before? I, I was just going to ask if you thought of trying to capture verbal expressions or shouts or things like that. Uh, no, we did not. <laughs> that would be interesting. People did that a lot. Uh, we, 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 we gave them an option of pressing the space bar when they got really frustrated. But only one person did that. Uh, 
and uh, yeah, other people didn't. Uh, we didn't tell them that that would actually change anything. So I don't know if that would have you know prompted them to to do that, but. Yeah, so we didn't really think of presence. Uh, we didn't actually think that maze ball game would be like engaging. We were just thinking Pac-Man, so we didn't actually measure how much immersed people were in their experiences. Also, it was very short. Uh, but but the second part is uh, so yes, we I, I will show in a couple of slides, and I want to get there in thirty seconds. Uh, but yeah, we, we did see that there were interesting results that we got based on how much people felt the game was challenging based on these information, these specific information values in the game. Uh, actually, let me just. Right. Yeah, that's exactly. So it's, well, so for now, we just analyze how many that they could see on an average uh, for a particular variant. Uh, but we also have some sort of really preliminary. This is in, over the, in the last week. Uh, but we actually measured how far away the zombies were as well uh, within the frame and how, how, how that affected uh, physiological input. So, uh, so yeah, we, we have that. We just haven't analyzed it that much. So this is very, very recent work. Uh, only in the last few months that we've put this together. Um, So we also tested to see if uh, if camera variants. So one of the one of the problems we had was uh, if we chose a particular camera variant. So let's say six distance, fifteen height, and and uh, 0.35 coherence. Uh, does that actually mean that the amount of information that you get in terms of these three information parameters is the same? And how do you compare it to a different variant? Right. So does that actually change? Uh, if you change the variance, and we actually see that it does change significantly, uh, so we, we we tested for that, and I'll jump to another the one that uh, uh, one of the interesting results. So we co we, we correlated, so we trained a, a perceptron to learn uh, the correlationship between uh, information values and uh, and challenge preferences. So specifically, challenge preferences, right? And we found that uh, enemy and maze information was negatively correlated to challenge preferences. So when within a variant, when they had more information about the enemy and more information about the maze, they were less. They were they felt less challenged. Uh, but that wasn't the case for tokens, which is interesting, right? The more tokens they saw, the more challenge they felt. Uh, which initially, like you would think that it's unintuitive, but then it was a 90-second game. So the more tokens they saw, the more they thought they had to achieve. Uh, so that sort of explains uh, those results. And I'm gonna skip this. So we are, we are doing more analysis on uh, uh, or like multi-layer uh, perceptrons on. Uh, all these different features that we've collected, we've collected lots of them, uh, and then trying to f uh, have an algorithm that can predict uh, different emotions or dif different emotional states. And we want what we want to do is then adapt this, uh, have an adaptive camera that can then uh, look at these uh, output of these to say, okay, now I want to increase challenge. Given my current camera variant, which parameters to change in order to increase or decrease uh, preference? Uh, we also did a little experiment where 
we had people pick their variants. Uh, and a lot of people, what they preferred was they went back, formed a strategy for where to move next, went down, and then played first person or very close, and then went through a couple of uh, maze uh, corridors. Then they went back again and switched back and forth. And the idea is you want some sort of an intelligent camera controller that could, that could do that. Uh, and then I think I'm five minutes over. Uh, if you're interested, uh, these the, these are these both of these demos are available online. They they just run on the browser. Um, so here I'm. I'll just show what it looks like. Close up and, and then farther out. Two different variants that I can sort of switch between. So this is the first step towards sort of adaptive camera control. We've tried to break down the camera variable space uh, and systematically study user experience and uh, correlationship with player, uh, player models. Uh, and then we, we want to now sort of take this work and then extend it so that we can actually bring it into, into games and come up with some interesting game designs that are actually purely. Uh, so as you can see, camera is here in the maze ball case, a design component, which it hasn't been seen as such. Uh, so there's actually a lot, a lot more you can do with cameras in games than just having fixed genre specific camera profiles. Uh, so that's sort of the motivation. Uh, and then uh, these demos are available at gameai.itu.dk. So you can play maze ball over there. Uh, it's in one of those links. Uh, and then I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators. Uh, Georgios and, uh, and, and our students who worked on programming this. Uh, thank you very much. I was just curious about uh, if there's a if you've thought about considering exclusion constraints or or uh, cinematic shots where you want to leave out something, while including other things. Uh, for example, it's common for in a, maybe a game cinematic to to show a couple of characters, but not if it's going to reveal the the kind of off scene uh, stuff that's going on. Any thoughts to that? So we haven't specifically tried to do that. Uh, using this potential fields approach. Uh, but you could, you could potentially just set the potential fields in such a way that those, the view particle doesn't lie in certain regions. Right? So you can block out. Uh, and the blocking out part, if you have some way of identifying, which in this case you would, right, of the parts that shouldn't be in view, then you just block out the view particle completely from those locations and then have similar kinds of uh, potential field tweaks that you could do to the position particle so that the position particle never actually is in the direction in which uh, you, you can potentially be there. Uh, and then in traditional sort of the research constraint solvers uh, are more powerful because they actually specifically have constraints for exclusion. Uh, we just haven't gone through the list of all the possible constraints that, uh, and then tried to map them. Uh, but but those are pretty fast. So once you have a solution, it's easy to sort of compute whether something is in visibility and then uh, move the particle somewhere else so that it could converge to a new solution. Right. Uh, again, it's it it's hard to do uh, real time when the player is playing, but in in pre-scripted cinematics, it's easier because the designers are, designer has a lot of control. Uh, and the idea is to put this in a tool so that they can sort of iteratively build this, uh, but still not have to specify spline curves for motion. <laughs>